to be glad in it? All right. Amen. Amen. We continue our study through Philippians um, chapter 3. The, we're going to do verses 4 through 6 today. Um, in our last installment, if you will, of the study, we began, we did the first few verses of chapter 3. And um, Paul was beginning a warning. He, it seemed like he had to warn several churches of this, but... Um, you know, when Christianity started, it was primarily a Jewish Christians. And um, as Paul went out and took the gospel to non-Jewish people, um, there was a group of Jewish Christians that kind of came out, came behind him and would tell them that they needed to become part of Israel first, that they needed to enter the covenant with Israel first because only Israel could... Um, be in covenant with Christ. And um, theologians call them Judaizers. And so at the beginning, of, in the first three verses, he said, he calls them dogs and mutilators of flesh, referring to circumcision. Um, but he was putting it in a derogatory way because he was just, I think, annoyed with these people folks and he wanted to warn them you know remember the church at Philippi was largely Gentile and probably largely Roman um, so these folks didn't have a whole lot of background with you know Judaism and so forth what they knew was Zeus and Apollo and and those guys and um, they certainly probably did a lot of different things that we would think were odd so they were uninformed and maybe they were a little bit naive and they wanted you know they wanted to be whatever it was God wanted them to be and so he warned them about them and he said that um, that true circumcision was a spiritual circumcision it wasn't a physical one you know in the covenant with Israel and God circumcision was an outward sign uh, of this covenant. And so he's saying that that circumcision is of the heart, that our heart needs to be separated, needs to, to be different than everybody else's. And obviously that is the love, agape. You know, for God so loved, for God so agape that... Um, unconditional love that unconquerable love God so unconquerably loved us we can't m mess up enough to conquer his love for God so loved so agape the world and that's the word that refers to sinners it's not just talking about the planet earth it's talking about the people of earth it's talking about the way of not serving God for God so loved sinful man it could be translated for God's unconquerable love for sinful man. He gave his only son for us. So that's really what it is about. And um, last week when I was talking, you know, well, he talks about spirit and flesh in that, that he doesn't have any confidence in the flesh. So he's saying this, this circumcised life is um, worshiped by the spirit um, glory in Christ and no confidence in the flesh. And by that he meant my ability to be right with God outside of the empowerment of God um, without the really the um, new birth. You know, he, so he picks that up today in these verses. So finishing the latter part of verse 4, he says, If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. So he had this pedigree. You know, if, if anybody was going to be self-righteous, he could, he could be, and he was. <laughs> and sometimes I think it still battled for him. Um, there's a 
story in, I don't know if it's in Acts, I think, um, actually, I think Paul talks about it, but he and Peter are all at this big mill, probably like an agape mill, <laughs> and they're all around the table talking, and there's all of these non-Jewish people there, and Peter's sitting on amongst them, you know, um, you know, drinking and eating, and talking about the Lord and stuff and then Jewish Christians come in and he slowly slinks away and removes himself from the Gentile Christians and goes sits with them and that just annoyed Paul you know so I think he had a struggle with anger so <laughs> he just like probably inappropriately he got up and like just give Peter the what for um, you know and I, that is the way God wants us to handle those kind of things. I mean, there is a point in Scripture where um, if, if when you go to your brother or sister that's, in, that's doing harmful things to their life, they're not loving God, if they don't accept it, then you have a pastor or somebody or other come to them and so forth. There's this whole process. And then there's even what um, the church calls excommunication where you separate yourself for a while. Um, Paul talked about this in Corinthians because uh, there was this guy there um, that was living with his stepmother. So he wasn't married, and it was his stepmother. So there was all kinds of wrong there from his standpoint. And so he told them, you know, you need to, you need, shouldn't be proud of this. Like they were thinking that this was a good thing, that we are so, you know, cool and modern or whatever, we're doing this thing. And you know, this is the first century. They even had those issues. So um, they, they, they take his word and they separate. And I guess, though, they never reconciled. And so his second letter, he's saying, hey, you know, um, there's a point to, to separating it so that, that they will come back to the Lord, that, that there will be, uh, you know, you need to be open to reconciliation. So that's just a little side note there. So... Um, so these Judaizers taught that you had to be an Israelite um, to get saved, basically. And the, it made me think about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and he refers to the Sinai covenant as the ministry of the letter and the covenant with Christ as the ministry of the Spirit. And he makes, a, he makes this declaration, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Literally there, he's saying, the letter executes me. The letter slays me. It, it is, and it's not letter like A, B, C, D. It's letter like, dear Ginger, I was glad to see you. It's, so it's, it's like the whole word of God just on its own without um, the spirit of God to guide you. Um, all it does is condemn you. All it does is say, hey, you're not doing the right things. You know, a, a sign on the road that says, don't go past 55, it's not going to keep you from driving, you know, 60. But it's warning you, hey, and if there's like, you know, highway patrol dude up there behind the, um, the, the bush there and you go driving by 60, then he can pull you over. Um, but the word of God if it's written on our heart, will um, change us and transform us. So, so he says, if anyone else thinks they have this reason to put confidence in the flesh, meaning that somehow or another I am better than everybody else, I have more. You know, he has this pedigree, and he, he was a member of the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two denominations, if you will, or political groups, and the, one of the distinctions between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was the Pharisees believed the whole Old Testament was what we were to live by, whereas Sadducees only looked at the first five books. And because of that, they didn't believe in the resurrection and so forth. There was all these things. So basically saying, hey, not only was I born an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, but um, in, in regards to um, God's law, I take the whole thing. I don't just take part of it. You know, that, you know, so, <laughs> and that zeal that, um, 
that n knowing about God and not really knowing God led him to see the church as being blasphemous because they were saying that Jesus was God. You know, that, you know, because one of the core things is that there is only one God. And to him, he saw that as saying that there was more than one God rather than God being one had to do with the, the oneness of the Trinity, the, the unity of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're like of a one mind, one mindset. They're, they're completely in unison, um, like as if they're one person. They have that um, synchronicity. So, so he went out and persecuted them, and um, in you know he says he was in regards to legalistic righteousness, or I would say self righteousness. Um, the rabbis of Paul's time and Jesus' time said that there are six hundred and thirteen commandments in the Old Testament. Three hundred sixty five of those um, are do not. So they call them negative. So there's 365 commandments in the Old Testament that say don't do this. There's 248 that say do that. You know, these are things that you need to do. And um, after Israel came back from Babylon, um, they wanted to make sure they never get kicked out of Israel again. And so the religious leaders came up with what they they referred to them as hedges, but basically they took those 613 things, especially those 365 that you aren't to do, and they did other, they added kind of like laws, if you will, to it so to keep you from actually committing the sin. So, you know, this, the law that it says don't lie or don't give false testimony, they had other things that you would do if you broke those it was like a early warning system saying, hey, you're going to end up lying, you know, so, you know, you need to stop. And so he was faultless in that. And um, I think the, the lesson for us here is that this is a relationship with God, not um, just uh, a religion. I think many times we see coming to church or listen to a message or giving offerings as like brownie points um, or S&H &S green stamps or something or other type of thing that we're putting in our little book there and when we get them all filled up we're going to go get to buy something in heaven. Um, but only the Lord, only the Lord's work on the cross, that's the only thing that saves us. That's the only thing. We don't do stuff because we're going to get saved or we'll be um, more holy, if you will. Um, we do those things because that's what God wants us to do. That's what being a believer is about. You know, like last week I was saying about coming to church. Church in itself, just coming into this building and sitting in a pew doesn't get you closer to God. Um, it's about being where his people are at and um, – the writer of Hebrews said, how are you going to exhort one another or, you know, encourage one another, push each other towards doing better things if you're not together with one another? That is why we come together because it's, nobody's a long ranger. There's no individual Christians or islands. We need to be a community. We need to be a fellowship um, that we're accountable one to another with, and that doesn't happen unless we get together. And we really should get together more than on Sundays and Wednesdays. We need to have time that we set apart for each other to get to know one another on a personal level. Um, I believe when James said that the, uh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, I think for me to have an effective prayer and a fervent prayer, an intercession for you, I need to know you. Um, and that can only happen with getting together. And this is a place that's set apart for that purpose. You know, the word holy means set apart, meaning that it, is, it has been set aside from the other things to be used for that specific purpose. So like this um, stand is set apart from those other stands <laughs> for me to use as my podium. Um, 
So uh, from a just that doesn't mean that it's holy necessarily, but um, it has been set apart for God's use. Now, we all are set apart for his use. Whether we stay set apart, that is really on our side of it. You know, God's love for you is assured, but we may not believe it, you know, because of of our past, the the, the relationships we've had um, before we were a believer and even after we've been a believer where people have disappointed us, let us down, or we've let other people down. Those, that forms our truth. And so sometimes we don't really have the truth. The, our mindset, the things that we act on naturally are not the truth. They're not the way God designed humans to live and interact and love one another. And so we have a cheap version of love in our mind, um, an insufficient one. And that is ultimately what it's about. Um, as I was looking at this and thinking about how, in contrast of um, him once, um, let me see here. Uh, Paul had been a person who had gauged his right standing or righteousness with God by outward things, his confidence in the flesh. By those standards, he was faultless. Um, I grew up in church, in, in the Church of God. My dad was a pastor of Church of God. And, um, and, you know, I grew up in that. I went to Sunday school every Sunday. Um, they didn't have children's church, so I had to sit through the sermons um, at the church I went to. So I thought it was nap time, um, generally, except for when I was with my brothers. But um, anyway... Growing up in that, being immersed in it, going to Sunday school, hearing all these stories, I still didn't realize that it was about love. Um, I thought it was about doing right, which it is, but it's doing right out of love. It's not just doing right, you know, and um, my perception of, of a relationship with God was that all these outward things, you know, because, uh, you know, growing to, growing up in the Church of God, you know, it was, my, my parents anyway, their version of it was, you know, you don't, you can't go to the movies um, because even if I went to some Disney G movie, um, I was still supporting the other movies that were there that were R and X rated or whatever. And um, we couldn't go to dances, which, you know, as an adult, being a father of a daughter and, and son, I can see, you know, any kind of slow dancing and stuff. You know, you it's probably n is not a good thing to, to do, but those things aren't what saves you. They're the things that if you love God, you know that he has a certain way he wants us to interact as husbands and wives and so forth, and we don't want to do those things. But those, that was in my mind, that these, all these don'ts, the... Um, you know, um, I was trying to think of uh, things like don't smoke, don't drink, don't go to the movies. If you're a guy, you're supposed to have short hair. Um, this was the 60s and all the things that were going on when I was a kid. So <laughs> and uh, and into the 70s and um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other stuff. My dad. Well, of course, there wasn't really cable till like, like 1970 or 71. And we certainly didn't get it. We had this old black and white TV, no color TV. My dad just soon not have the TV in the house. He called it a 20-inch sewer pipe. Boy, if today he would say a lot worse, I think, about it. Um, <laughs> so anyway, those are the things that, in my mind, I thought that's what it meant to be a Christian. And so as the, the Lord began to pursue me even more hot and heavy, um, I thought I needed some outward transformation. You know, um, I had all kinds of stipulations about things. And so the Lord began to deliver me from those things um, as far as them holding me back from making a decision. You know, like, you know, it was the 60s and the 70s, and I had fallen into, you know, doing a lot of stupid stuff. And um, the Lord had to deliver me from those. And um, I even like cut my hair down to where it was um, 
not quite a six o'clock shadow. It might have been as, as short as Keith's because um, I thought God wouldn't accept me without all these things in my mind that um, God wanted. I thought I had to be the, the um, perfect person, I guess, if you will, in my mind. You know, I had, to, I had to already be sanctified before God would take me in as his child. So, event, so all these things God took away from me where I had no distractions and no reasons, and I came to the Lord, and, and I asked him to forgive me of my sins, and I got saved and so forth. And so as I was an early believer, I, be, I continued to think those things. Maybe not quite like some people might do it and say, oh, I do these, so I'm better than this other person. And maybe none of us really consciously think that. Um, but... Um, you know, Paul, as Saul, he thought that he had it down. He thought, you know, and I think he was sincere. I mean, but he did not have really a relationship with God. It was all about these things. He, he, I think he saw God as far off, not as someone close up. You know, the Apostle John, when he writes his gospel, he uses the word logos, um, which is translated word, that the word was among us. And for the Greeks, Logos was not even a living thing. It was the um, it was like the force on Star Wars. You know, it was this this power that held the universe together and even the gods were subject to the Logos. So when John declares that that Jesus is the Logos, that that the Logos is not this inanimate being or inanimate thing. It was a it's a person and it, and this person loves you that's what it's for that he died on the cross for you that was like revolutionary for them for the gentiles um so as i was growing in the lord i was reading i'm sure i'd read in romans many times but as i was i was reading in romans and this passage just emboldened to me almost like 3d you know like you remember how you got those holographic cards and you could like turn them and stuff for the baseball player or something or other hitting. Um, anyway, it was like that. It was like these words raised and it said, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then a little bit further he says, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That just stood out to me that while I was an enemy to him, I was somebody that didn't care and maybe even opposed to it. I, I mean, I was young. I mean, I was 18 when I got saved, so it wasn't like I'd lived a whole lot of life. Um, but I was hostile towards it. Uh, you know, I was embarrassed of my mom, you know, because, for one, we weren't like the standard like Baptist church or something like that. I was from a Pentecostal family, so who knows, man. Maybe my mom might break out and speak in tongues in front of my friends or something or other. So I was, you know, like scared of that. But I just felt like if, if there is a God, if there's a God, then it can't be this God of the Bible. Surely he's like um, Odin or something or other or Zeus or somebody cool in my mind, I was thinking at the time. Um, not, you know, the God of the Bible, you know, and I was thinking, you know, if I get to heaven, is it going to be like church service? Am I going to like be bored for eternity there in my mind? You know, because for one, I didn't have the ability really yet to connect with God. It wasn't until I was born again and the spirit of God filled me that I was able to really connect in that way that it, it just changed it. But fortunately, even before I got saved, the Holy Spirit was able to get through my thick head and speak to me. I mean, no matter how, what I did, because I certainly, I told my mom when I was about 14, I wasn't going to go to church anymore. So I stopped going to church, you know, because my dad died when I was 12. So, and my mom wasn't the person that like spanked you or anything. That was my dad. And I was the baby of the family. So da, da, da. So I'm out there really messing things up. And even so, the prayers of my par my family, you know, God was out there. I I can distinctly remember summer of seven, 1978, just before I was going to start my senior year, I was with a bunch of my friends out in the backwoods somewhere, 
so that the police wouldn't see us. And as we were in the dark, the person at front had turned on the, I'm sure I've told this story before, the interior light on so that they could see what they were doing. And when that happened, I saw my reflection in the window and I believe the Holy Spirit now, but I said, you know, what are you doing here? You know, and that was the catalyst of it. You know, I still continued to do some destructive things, but, and, it, and probably to my mom and other family, it looked like I was getting worse. But on the inside, I was this turmoil, the, the Holy Spirit speaking to me and drawing me to him and, and removing things from my life so that there was nothing the enemy could use to block me. And I w at, at that point, you know, I felt like I had to be in a church. When I was at that church, I was, it was like there was no bondages around me. There was nothing holding me so that my mind was clear enough that I could make a decision and say, you know, God is real, and I need him, and I ask him to forgive my sins. You know, I grew up in the church. I knew the whole deal, but um, this church we were going to is called Revival Center, and they had church seven days a week. Um, and... So we, I was at the church service, and as they would begin, the whole congregation would go up to the altar and begin to intercede and pray. And so I'm like the only person left in a pew, um, and they're all up there praying and stuff. And so as they were doing that, I asked God to forgive me of my sins. And as I did that, um, my niece, who my sister's 20 years older than me, so my niece is the same age as me, she had this vision or something in you know that um she saw angel rejoicing so and then afterwards i felt compelled to tell everybody and so i stopped the service and told everybody and so forth but the thing is paul didn't want people to trade away this this relationship for a religion you know the way that the judaizers were doing it you're having to go through all of these things, the, the things were what were connecting you and making you, you um, godly. That's not to say that we don't do those things. It's not to say that, that the 613 commandments we don't need to do. We just don't need to worry about it. We need to worry about having a relationship with God and letting his spirit put those things in our heart. It doesn't mean I don't need to still read this. The way God works is, I put this in my head, and he begins to write it to my heart. You know, that's what the, our new covenant is. The word of God will be written on our heart. We still got to get the printed version of it um, and begin to read it. And don't read it like homework. You know, I know the word disciple means student, but it's student more like your child and teaching them how to walk and teach, you know, modeling in front of them how a husband or a wife should be. That's what it's talking about. It's not some chore. It shouldn't be anyway. I mean, most of us, with, you know, I'm sure Pastor Leo doesn't think of talking to Mamie as a chore, you know. Um, and, you know, in that respect, our relationship with God, we, we, we need to make time. We have to be intentional, just like we have to be intentional with human relationship. We have to, you know, no matter how busy life is, You've got to take whatever moments you have to, to love your wife or your husband and, and doing things with them and so forth. I mean, even if it's at home in the little nook at the window and having coffee, you know, whatever it is, you need to do that. And in the same manner, we have to make time for God. Nothing else can be more important than that. And I think that is what Paul is trying to make to ensure that they're not trading away some cold mechanical thing for something warm, a relationship with God where he, we can know he's faithful because he loves us and we can know that because of how we've experienced life. You know, as we get his word into us, he brings us through experiences and those experiences transform us. They, they make the word a truth to us. They make us know the truth which is Jesus. So, you know, later on, Paul says all these things 
that he can do, he declares they're nothing but rubbish. When we're focused on outward things, we can think we're superior to others. They are beneath us. From that perspective, it's hard to forgive or apologize. It's critical that, that we can forgive people and we can apologize to another. Um, and conversely, if we think we're worthless, not able to do anything, we may not think we should be forgiven. Both of those are bad places to be at. They aren't where God wants us to be at. And when we boil everything down to just things, doing them, and not really, you know, if our why to do it is because we're wanting to get those spiritual SNH green stamps rather than um, I love this person and I want to do what's best for them. You know, sometimes when you want to do what's best for somebody, that might not be something that will cause fuzzy feelings on their side. They may not like it. You know, my, if you're a parent, all you got to do is look at your kids. You know, when my oldest was young, you know, we were young, but, um, you know, they want to get into stuff. They're curious. And, you know, they're not doing anything wrong, but we don't want them to get hurt. You know, I don't know if when your kids were young they had these, but we had these plugs you put into light sockets, and um, we we had these, like, um, lock things you could put on cabinets so they couldn't get in there and get the Drano or whatever, you know, type of stuff. I mean, we did all those kind of things, and, and there was even, like, you know, pins we would we that we could put out there, not, you know, to put the kids in. And I can remember... Um, my son, my older son, you know, when I would have to pick him up from something, he'd get frustrated about it. You know, I'm sure in his head he thought I was holding him back. You know, um, he didn't get that there was something dangerous there. You know, and that's the way God is training us. That is, that is knowing him will begin to understand that, that he loves us so much that he's willing to do stuff that might not we might not like you know um, nobody likes to be punished or disciplined um, but it's for our good hopefully generally uh, so anyway so so Paul's wanting us to know and we need to know not that we need to approach God in a personal way that that he is a person and it is, he's not just some, you know, big CEO out there somewhere and we're the, the lowest person on the company or something like that. That's not what it is. He's dad. He is Abba. That in the Hebrew word for father is Ab, A, A B. So Abba, not the musical group. Um, well, it's like saying Dada in English. You know, it's, it's like a little kid trying to say daddy um, or dad, but they can't quite pronounce it. That's what the word Abba means. And he says that we can call him Abba. That's where he wants the relationship to be at. That's what we were made to do. But he doesn't want his kids to be spoiled brats, for one. Um, so... So he's going to train us and teach us, and we have to submit to that. And I think, I don't know if it was last week or week before last, I was talking about how there are several passages where it shows that, that he does these things for those who love him. His love for us is assured. It's not something we got to win. We don't love him back to make sure he keeps loving us. We love him back because that's what a relationship does. And... Um, in doing so, he's able to to release the things that he wants to do in our lives. You know, when when we don't really love him and trust him, he he's hindered. He's kind of stymied in the transformation process in our life. And so, anyway, so so we need to have that personal relationship with God. We need to be aware of our motivations on why we do things you know we should come together because um, we're a community we're a family we need to be together we need to be able to encourage one another and that's what God wants us to do it's not gonna 
impress God more about you. It's not going to get you any closer to heaven to come to church. It's just what you need to do. Just like you need to go home every night and be with your family. So, Father, I just thank you for your loving kindness, your mercies that are new morning to morning. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are faithful, that how great your faithfulness is, and that it can be trusted, relied upon. Lord, help us to um, continue to pursue after you, to get to know you, to have ourselves transformed, to be in the likeness of your son. Um, Just bring healing to us, to our bodies, to our hearts, and to our minds. And we thank you for your provision. Lord, we thank you for meeting our needs. And thank you for meeting our wants. And we just thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. All right.